let me just touch on what Tim said as the company. Um, 105 year old company is in 61 years as a listed public company, having paid a dividend every single year for 61 years. Um, these numbers are June 18. Um, we own probably $330 million of property as we sit today. Um, we represent all those different car brands, uh, those uh, number of employees and dealerships. Now, the um, ownership, as Tim pointed out, in automotive holdings there is closer to 30% as we speak today. Um, also, let me mention this tiny one at the bottom, 7.8% of um, ownership of Cox Automotive. In the minute I'm gonna talk about the future, things like subscription-based um, automotive um, um, operations. Subscription is uh, growing in the US. It's a brand new method of ownership. Instead of owning a car, you subscribe to a car. Uh, and there are different forms of subscription that suit, suit different people. The leading player of subscriptions in the world at the moment is Cox Automotive. We are the largest shareholder in Cox Automotive Australia. Um, we're ready to launch subscription services in this country at the moment. However, we've got a few other priorities. Um, the technology is available through our partner and sometime in 2019, probably towards the end of the year, you will see offerings of subscription-based um, automotive uh, retailing as such uh, through our company at some point later next year. Uh, just to stick with the past for a second, um, I have the great privilege once a year to go to the AP Eagers Past Employees Christmas, um, uh, basically Christmas lunch and function. Now, there aren't many companies today in the kind of fast society that we live in that actually has a past employees association. And it is important when you're talking about the future just to reflect on the past for a second. The president and the vice president of the past employees association are all, or both of them are in their late 80s. They both worked at AP Eagers before I was born and they meet with about 150 other members three times a year to discuss the good old days at Newstead when Eagers Holdings were there at Newstead producing and assembling Holdens and they meet three times a year and these two people left the company, actually sorry let me just clarify, they both left the company before I was born. They both worked for the company, they left the company, one of them got moved to Townsville, one of them got moved somewhere else with their family, and they are that passionate about AP Eagers. Now, let me just follow that on for a second. A sales consultant, a road tester, and a workshop supervisor, what would they have in com common? Three of those individuals through, that, um, through those different roles will both clock, uh, sorry, the three of them will clock up 40 years service in January at AP Eagers. 40 years service. Now, that's 40 years of service from three individuals just in the month of January. Every three months, I sign the next three months worth of 10, um, 20, 30, 40, and sometimes 50 year service records, and three people clock up 40 years in January alone. I think next year we have 15 people that will clock up 40 years worth of service. There are not many companies around anywhere in the world that have that kind of loyalty. I want you just to bear that in mind with the past. Now, let me just ask you a question that I want you to just think about that I'm going to touch on right at the very end of the presentation. And I just want you to think about this. I'm not going to embarrass anybody by actually asking the answers. But if you had to choose the perfect commute time, the perfect commute time, it could be zero, it could be an hour or longer, how long would your personal perfect commute time to work be? There's been a survey done on this and there were some very interesting answers that I'll give you at the end, but just give that some thought whilst I go through the rest of the presentation. This is a good slide and a bad slide. It's a great slide in the middle portion of it, and it is fair to say that at the top of the slide there, it is levelling out. And that is something that, if you're a shareholder in this room, I'm not proud of. We are going through a transition period right now that we're adapting 
to get that strength back in the company to be moving forward. Because there are a few things that are going on in our industry and in our company to adapt for the next 20 years. And so we have slowed and that growth has slowed, but that doesn't mean that it will slow for the future. So what differentiates AP Eagers from the rest of our industry? This isn't necessarily um, uh, every other industry, but the board itself own 39% of the company. And some people may know of Nick Politis, who owns 36% of the company, but there are other members on the board that actually own 3% of the company. And so the company has 39% of the entire company sitting at every single board decision. I will tell you that for the last pleasure 13 and a half years, one of the things I love about AP Eagers is that every single decision is made for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, not for the next reporting period. And that is a really good factor when you're a CEO, is you're not having to be forced to make decisions that only affect what the next published result will be. And in particular, Nick Politis, who has been a shareholder since 2000, has never sold a share. Uh, Nick's mum's 101. Uh, Nick's going to be around for quite a long period of time, and he has no need to sell a share, and he's building a long-term legacy in terms of his stakeholding, rather than worrying about what the share price is today or tomorrow, etc., etc. Um, the shareholder base, 61% of the entire shareholder base is associated with automotive. We have bought companies in the past, we bought Clusters in Newcastle, we bought the Birrell Group, we bought uh, businesses in Adelaide and Darwin and other areas, and a lot of those shareholders that we paid shares for in the last 13 years have not sold a single one of them. Our second largest shareholder is an automotive player being the founder of Automotive Holdings Group. Uh, actually, that's not correct, that's the Batalis is our second largest, which is a big retailer uh, down, in, um, uh, down in Melbourne. Our third largest shareholder is the Wheatley family who founded the Automotive Holdings Group. Um, um, Robin Piper obviously is the uh, widow of Alan Piper, and so the top four shareholders are actually all associated with automotive. Now, the importance of that is that they understand the things that we're going through. Um, management stability is not just with me at 13 and a half years in the role. Uh, my number two has been in the current role he's in, which is basically operations manager. Um, he's been in that role for 12 and a half years and been with the company for 15 years. And all of our regional leaders around the country are in their roles on average greater than 10 years. Now, I'm not going to um, quote the uh, current other largest competitor, but they have got changes all over the place in senior management from the top all the way through their whole organisation. Now what that leads to is this next comment, which is the partnership relationship with our stakeholders. And in particular at a company like ours, we're a franchise operator. We operate a Toyota franchises, BMW, Mercedes, um, et cetera, et cetera. And in order to do that and continue to grow, we have to have sensational relationships with the presidents, the vice presidents of these different global brands. And there is nobody better than Nick Politis for doing this role as a large shareholder and as a supporter of me. I think I'm reasonably good at it, but I think the whole of our team is very, very good at it. The final point is property flexibility. And the reason why this is important is because retailing is going to change over time. Our average lease tenure is only three and a half years. We own a third of our total property portfolio and effectively our average flexibility across every property we own or use is effectively 2.6 years. Over the next seven or eight years, there are gonna be some changes associated with where automotive retailing takes place and the flexibility of our property portfolio is one of the leading components of our strategic edge against our competitors. Maybe I should have said, we're 5.5% of the entire industry. So there's still, automotive holdings are around 7%, 
Then there's two private equity players that got in and would love to have got out. And there's then one other listed company. All of those combined are only 15 to 16% of the total industry. The other 84 to 85% of the industry is in um, family holdings where a lot of them are in their 60s and 70s. Okay, this was a quote I picked up uh, off of the Financial Review uh, back in 2017. Uh, Scott said, it's actually easier to build a big company than it is to build a long-term company because companies are optimised for their current environment. When change happens, it's ine inevitable that companies can't adapt. It's not the largest company, it's not the most successful company, it's not the strongest company, it's the most adaptable companies that are going to survive. And the reason why I love that quote is when you are sitting in a company that's 105 years old and 106 on January the 7th, it is about the legacy and you know there's so much responsibility on my shoulders about making sure that I'm not the one that screws it up. Right? That's a really important comment. I don't care if I've been there 13 years and I've got a reasonable track record. The reality is a 105-year-old company is something that deserves to be very, very, very carefully managed to make sure that the next 10, 15, 20, and the next 100 years are there. And that's rare in companies that are old. But we are very, very adaptable. So that's where I'm going to move on to. These are the global industry changes that are coming. And there are four or five articles in every single newspaper in Australia every single day now on how electric or autonomous cars or uh, mobility, Uber, etc., are going to completely change the world and how people like AP Eagers aren't going to exist. And I would suggest that maybe some of the um, uh, um, weaknesses that we face at the moment in our industry sector from um, perception is the fact that we may not exist in five or ten years' time. I don't believe that's going to be the case at all. It is for you to make the judge on your views on that. Now, as I said to Tim, I could do an hour on each one of these four lines. And so it's going to be a little bit hard, but let me just touch on a couple of points. All you hear about when electric is mentioned is about Tesla. The press is all about Tesla. More than 75% of every single either electric or hybrid car on the road today, because electric or hybrid or electric pure, they're very, very close in terms of the sector, right? Very, very soon we're going to have the Jaguar I-Pace that's going to come out that's fully electric. There's a range of new electric cars that are coming out that are 100% electric, and the range of new cars that are coming out that are going to be hybrids, um, electric and petrol. But 75% of every single electric or hybrid in the world is a Toyota Prius. And how many articles are you reading on a regular basis about the Toyota Prius? Virtually none. Toyota is our largest profit earner. Toyota is our best partnership. Toyota's investment in this total space is far more than Tesla's and you're not reading about any of it. So I will say as well, and I, there's a slide next coming up with Tesla um, in there. Tesla have done a fantastic job at forcing the rest of the industry into the electric car race. But let me tell you, there is a hundred billion dollars that is currently being invested in the last 18 months from all the global car makers in the electric space. Tesla is a great brand. It is a great car, but there is nothing that differentiates Tesla from all the other manufacturers in the long term. I will come on to autonomous in a moment about Waymo and Google and all those other things about autonomous, but from an electric point of view, Tesla has dragged the others in, but they're now spending 10, 15, 20 times more cash than Tesla is on the future. So I, my personal opinion is the electric space is gonna be one 
by the current existing players. Tesla's not going to go away, but it will be a brand in a sea of electric cars. The fully electric Porsche that is going to be out in 2020 is planning to smash Tesla. Whether it will or won't smash Tesla doesn't really bother me, but Tesla is not going to be having a free reign in what's there. Now, autonomous is different. Um, oh, I should just add, today in the globe, electric and hybrid vehicles are still only 1% of the entire annual sales, sales, and in comparison to the number, there, there are 90 million new cars sold globally a year. There's 1.2 billion motor vehicles on the road around the world today. So 1% of that 90 million is either electric or hybrid today being sold. The percentage of the 1.2 billion of cars on the road for electric or hybrid is in the minute point point percentages. So it is coming and it's coming on mass because of the extra 100 billion that's just gone in to doing it. But you're still only going to see sales between sort of 2020 and 2030 of growing from 1% to maybe three or four or five. And I think we'll be at a position where we might get as high as 15% of vehicle sales by 2030. But that's vehicle sales. The car park is still gonna be predominantly either petrol or diesel. Um, autonomous vehicles. Um, there's a lot of information out there about autonomous vehicles. Uh, there are some on the road. There's a whole range of um, uh, zero to five um, levels in there. Um, every single motor vehicle, I have the luxury of being put in a brand new car probably every four months or so. Effectively, they put me in a car, I run up six or seven or eight thousand kilometers and they sell it as a demo at a great price so that's a good way to buy a car by the way um, uh, but it does mean that every car i'm getting in has got a hundred percent of every new feature um, i was in a toyota the other day that's a radar it's a forty thousand dollar toyota that effectively um, is a level three with full radar where effectively you can set the speed and it will literally, a touch on the, uh, on the accelerator, it will speed up, it will stay within the lanes, it will stay from side to side. Um, there are issues when you get to a traffic light and you're going around bends, so it's not foolproof at the moment, but the reality is that that car at $40,000 um, is an early sign of what's gonna be in almost every single car as we move forward. Um, I've got to be careful about autonomous because I could just keep going forever and I've got to make sure I get some other points across. Um, mobility services, um, Uber and Lyft in the US in particular. Now, um, three years ago I was being bombarded by analysts. Um, the press, as I said, had all this stuff saying the millennials didn't want to buy cars. Um, look, a lot of millennials then get married and have a kid and then they buy cars. So the reality is Uber as an 18 or 20 or 21 year old is a sensational solution to young people. But um, I do not believe that people are going to go through their entire life just relying on effectively what is public transport. And I'll come back to that question I uh, raised at the beginning. But there are now, because uh, mobility services have been around for a long time, there are now some good studies on this. And there's a whole lot of studies that have been done in 20 major cities in the US recently where it proved that it was actually more expensive to use Uber as your only source of transport compared to owning a car. And as the National Automotive Dealer Association in the US said, this should have been front page of all the major newspapers because it debunks one of the big issues about mobility services that it's cheaper. And yet, it wasn't published hardly anywhere. And he's been going around trying to get it noticed. But the point I'm getting at is there are now a range of um, um, hard questions being asked about whether or not these things are gonna change the alternative to a personal uh, vehicle. Now, we don't have 2018's data yet, but let me tell you, in the US, in 2017, the number of motor vehicles per household increased 
again. Even with all the Ubers and all the Lyfts and all the mobility services and everything available in the US, the number of personal ownership of motor vehicles climbed once more last year per household. So current trends suggest that people still want their own personal mobility vehicle. The connected car is just the fact that in the future, every car is going to be connected to everything else. Every car is going to be connected to everything we own, our iPads, our iPhones. And there are going to be an increasing number of new income generating um, uh, models that are going to be available. Whether they're going to be available to me or to AP Eagers or to some of you in the room is obviously a question that's unanswered at the moment. But there are a range of new models that will come out of these changes that will be good income earning models. So let me move on though to an area that's probably the most important to me and that is the change in the way and where you buy cars because ultimately we're an automotive retailer. Now these are global trends. This slide is actually four years old. Let me just come back to that Tesla because everybody's talking about Tesla having a new business model. The only thing that Tesla, apart from dragging all the rest of the manufacturers into the electric race, which I really am grateful they've done, apart from that, the only difference in their business model is that they don't sell through dealers, they own the retail stores. Now, other manufacturers have tried owning their retail store. Tim mentioned the famous it's not famous to you guys, but the famous Sydney retail joint venture that I actually was the CEO of. I was the second CEO after the first one left after four months. When I arrived, it was losing $2 million a month. That's $24 million a year. And my only claim to frame is it took me four years to get the losses to zero so that it, they could resell it. <coughs> they paid $119 million for it and sold it for 16. Now, that's just an example of a manufacturer trying to run its own retail thing. And I'm not necessarily saying that's fair that Tesla are going to have this same experience. But let me tell you, in the US at the moment, they outsource most of their used car Tesla selling to automotive dealers. They outsource a range of service activities. They, when they started, had um, no commissions for salespeople. Now they have commissions for salespeople in the store. The only thing that is currently different about the Tesla business model is that it's occurring in a shopping center owned by Tesla. Otherwise, there is nothing different about their retailing model from a unique business proposition. And again, I'm not having a go at Tesla, but I don't think their business model is that unique. Now, those are the brands there and this is Carzoos. Now, Carzoos is only available today in two shopping centres, up at North Bates and down at Garden City. And it is fair to say that our building of a business model to sell vehicles inside shopping centres has taken a long time. Customers, believe it or not, even though, I will tell you right now, there is no better place to buy a used car. You get um, 12 months um, free comprehensive insurance when you work. We make less money per used car we have the most sensational customer satisfaction, but let me tell you, Australian customers are still not used to buying a car today inside a shopping centre, even though it's a far better deal. Now, if I've got these two ventures up and running and it's that hard to get customers to buy something, when I'm telling you right now, this is a better economic model for the customer. Now, it's a better economic model for me when I get um, greater and greater volume, now, we've built this slowly and slowly. We haven't spent a lot of money on marketing. Uh, we are extremely close to break even. And once we get beyond break even, then it does start to make a huge amount of sense. But this is where I do believe a lot of the future is going with a hybrid to the traditional retail. So let me move on to this here because the Brisbane Airport location is why I'm going or why AP Eagles is going to Brisbane Airport. We're not going to Brisbane Airport because it's an airport and we're not going there because they're going to build an incredible racetrack, skid pan and have 
They've sold, as I understand it, they have pre-sold 205 days of the track for the first five years. So there's going to be a lot of activity out at this racetrack. Let me show you that if you haven't seen it. So that is the Brisbane Auto Mall and all the areas in yellow are the areas that AP Eagers have secured. Um, we've secured effectively, you can't own freehold at the airport because it's owned by the federal government. But we've effectively prepaid for 76 years a lease that effectively is the same as paying freehold. So we're paying 30 million bucks for 64,000 square metres for effectively 76 years. Okay, now if I come back, this is why I'm going to the airport though. That yellow area is the auto mall. And this is not a made up stat because sometimes you do get some people that exaggerate on these. Within two minutes of leaving the auto mall entrance, you are either on the motorway heading towards the gateway bridge or on the motorway heading up the um, uh, motorway there or you're heading towards the tunnel. You're not in the tunnel in two minutes. Most of you know exactly where this is. But within two minutes you are on the road in either of those three directions. That is why the new hub of AP Eagers for the next 50 years is going to be at the airport. Effectively with the way retailing is going to change over the next 50 years, that hub can serve probably the whole of Brisbane. Now it can't serve the whole of Brisbane on its own. I'm not suggesting that every other retail car dealership is going to close down and the only place you're going to be able to go is the airport. But that is going to be such an attractive location. I should add, and I'll go, maybe I'll switch between these. I should add in the picture, which of course is the Brisbane Airport Corporation's marketing picture, that looks as though they're all traditional dealerships. We're not going to build traditional dealerships out there. We're going to have 12 brands, maybe more in the longer term, out there. There will be hubs where um, we will have subscription services. There will be um, probably uh, charging stations at every car park location for the future because obviously we're building this for 76 years and eventually 20, 20, 30, 5, 40 or whatever, everything will be electric. So there'll be charging stations out there, there'll be solar panels everywhere. This is not going to look like 12 car dealerships with a $10 million glass box and a service department behind it and a parts department behind that and parking out the front and used cars. The reality is car zoos will be our used car operation and there'll be a car zoos structure that will look very much like the shopping centres out at the airport. Now, what do I need to do to back it up? We just bought a new property, or we're just finalising a new property, where somewhere close to town, we're going to have a new 50 bay workshop. You're not going to be able to buy a car there, you're not going to be able to do anything other than service your car within a very close distance of the centre of town in a 50 bay workshop. It's not going to be for one brand, it's going to be for 12, 12 brands. I'm going to satisfy the brands because I've got 12 different counters, it's on two different levels. We're going to have six at one area and six at the other area. And the reality is that's going to be a standalone service department that will complement the airport. Some of you may know we own some land in Windsor and at Kedron. Um, some of those locations, we've got a Holden dealership in Windsor on Newmarket Road, if you know it. There's no way that is going to remain a single Holden dealership. That's likely to end up having four or five boutique showrooms with maybe three or four service bays behind those boutique showrooms, but the master showroom will be at the airport. Because again, I'm not assuming that every single customer will just jump in the tunnel and leave the city and go and do everything at the airport. So there's gonna be a hybrid between a, what I call a mothership at the airport, some boutique stuff that's close to town, and then the final component is we're currently negotiating with a major shopping center to put eight brands inside a shopping centre, four cars per brand in four, literally in a, a, a standard retail store with four cars in it, four cars of the next brand next door, etc. And the reason we're negotiating that area with this shopping centre is it's going to be like an auto mall. And instead of just having, as some of you would have seen, like the slide, if I go back to it, uh, yeah, sorry, like that slide there where there's maybe one BMW store and then there's no other store in that shopping centre. 
This is seven manufacturer brands in one location with car zoos next door to it. And at the particular shopping centre we're negotiating, we're currently negotiating to put a service department on the roof. So and that, at the moment the roof is used for staff car parking for that shopping centre. They believe they can move some of that staff um, car parking and we'll have a 20 bay um, workshop on the top. So customers at that particular location, it's a very expensive location, you probably all worked out where it is now, but anyway. Um, and the reality is that our retailing structure for the next 20 years in Brisbane is a hybrid between shopping centres, boutique stores, um, standalone service departments and the airport. Now, everything I just described, I can do for about 70% of my current cost. Our view is that I can probably, based on just today's business model, probably sell 40 or 50% more. Because effectively, I am going to probably keep 95% of all of my current customers, and I will just add, that means I won't be at Newstead. Now, I'm still going to be at Newstead for the next 10 years. So don't assume, uh, sorry, not for all of the brands, but for some of them. But um, don't assume that we're going to be out anytime immediately. This will not be, the airport will not be finished until 2025. I don't get the land till December 2020. We will move in in December 21, and we will have completed everything by 2025. So this isn't a five minute journey. We, we agreed the deal two years ago, and this is partly what I'm talking about, about us being in transition. Now, if you are in the room and you're a shareholder, I will tell you there are a large number of property companies fighting over our land in Newstead as we speak. And they're all fighting over that land at very attractive prices that are above the recent independent valuations. But I cannot say any more than that because that's a bit mis uh, not misleading, but the reality is there's enough people in the property circles that know that's going on. That doesn't mean the independent valuers are wrong, but that is something that we just have to do to evolve. Now, let me just come back. The future of automotive retailing. We are genuinely excited by these different components. I, I realise even if I'm listening to myself that this may not be as coordinated a speech as I would have loved. Honestly, we are excited and we are preparing and some of that preparation started three or four years ago. Most of it is in play right now. Um, Tim will criticise me if I don't say this. We did put out our earnings guidance. Um, our earnings guidance from an operational result will match last year's result. Our statutory number will not match last year's result because we had some sensational one-offs last year that we haven't been able to completely match this year. But operationally, in an industry that is really doing it tough, we are going to produce the same operational result this year as last year. And that is something that I will tell you, Nick Pilatus thinks is absolutely sensational. Now, I'm not just saying that because he is our 36% um, largest shareholder. He operates his own independent car dealerships that I can tell you are not anywhere near last year's result. And that again is something where um, I've got no room for bullshit in my role because if I'm not overperforming in a great market, Nick will know about it, and if I am overperform, or sorry, not I, if the team's overperforming in a tough market, he will at least know that and be able to assess that. So we think we're doing pretty well from a current position, but the most excitement is where all of this is leading. Now, um, let me come back to that question I asked at the front. Um, I am going to just ask one thing. Is there anybody who, in their mind, between leaving home and getting to work, and the other way around, finishing work and getting home, is there anybody in this room that chose zero as their commute time? Is there anybody that doesn't want to commute at all and wants zero time in their commute? Well, it's supposed to be about 5%. Um, <laughs> but the reason why I think it's important is that People were asked in this survey, and they did it in a town in Netherlands, and they did it in uh, three towns in the US, and I can't remember which towns. And 
it was 5% of people, because one of the options was you could be teleported back and forwards and be there instantaneously. And the concept when people were asked in some focus groups of actually having the ability to effectively walk out your front door and be straight at work or finish at the end of the day and be instantly home was horrific to most people. And the reason, and this is why I think this is important because all the stuff about mobility, all the stuff about autonomous and everything like that is completely ignoring human emotions. And the reality is most people value somewhere between 15 and 25 minutes of personal time in their personal vehicle to either wind down at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day to prepare and most people do not want less than 15 to 25 minutes of commute time because that personal space, their own music, their own thoughts is apparently one of the most valued things in people's day. And the reason I want to also point that out, in the US, as I said, car ownership is growing. Um, there's a title slide from a, a gentleman I'm bringing out from the US next year who says, Americans hate to share. Um, the reality is, everything about autonomous and robo-taxis and, and shared cars is suggesting that every one of us is happy just to jump in the vehicle with a whole range of other people. Most people hate sharing and being in a space with other people if they've got the choice of being in a motor vehicle and being on their own. Now, the final point I'm gonna make is a lot of the equations on electric and on autonomous is all about economics. The problem with that is that a large amount of the economics to bring down the cost of transport could occur today. If the only vehicle that any of us could buy was a 13,990 Kia, we would still have transportation that would be personal transportation. We have said for many, many years that a motor vehicle is somebody's metal suit of clothes. And that is something that is also being ignored in all of the research and all of the debates about even if we move towards autonomous cars, are we just gonna share the same autonomous car with everybody else? Or are we gonna to move towards autonomous cars and people are gonna potentially still wanna own those autonomous cars? I don't know all the answers, there's a long journey and we can all share over the next 15 years, because it's all gonna happen, we can all share over the next 15 years which way it goes, but it is really exciting and I can't see why AP Eagers isn't gonna be a significant company that's gonna actually be at the leading edge of all of these changes over the next 15 years. Thank you very much.